All right, Joe, we are back on the podcast where we are training men in spiritual fitness. And we are on the last week of our eight week challenge uh, through the life of Hudson Taylor, through times of guys praying and memorizing the promises of God. Where, uh, where are you at yourself, Joe, right now after having spent eight weeks with Hudson Taylor? Beneficial, challenged, where are you at? Well, yeah, yeah, definitely challenged. Uh, definitely, it's just a, uh, I think I, t- I tend to act whatever my default Joe mentality is. And what's been funny is it's this other voice in my head that's not my default uh, personality. Uh, what I think is Hudson Taylor's voice. And often it's telling me to do things that are the opposite of what I would do otherwise. So there's this aggravating voice like, no, don't worry, you know, trust, you know, you know, go, go, you know, do something, you know, show courage, go share the gospel, whatever. But um, pushing me, I think the direction I need to go in, but the one that uh, is uphill rather than downhill for me. Yeah, Uh, I agree. It's funny. You know, last week we talked about, um, what would happen if Hudson Taylor joined your church and what, what would, you know, what difference would it make? And then I, I went to church on Sunday and I heard conversations, you know, overheard people talking about Hudson Taylor and saying things like, Oh, Hudson Taylor wouldn't like it if you did that, or Hudson Taylor wouldn't do it that way. You know? And so I think it is, uh, it's infecting my world for sure. Uh, in a positive way. I think, yeah, like you said, it's always good to to rethink what you're doing and and see it through the eyes of, of another friend of someone, you know, who's, who's, Definitely placed their whole life in trust of God. I think that's a that's a that's a great model. Um, but we we find ourselves here at the end, the last week that these guys are going to be doing this challenge together. And um, you know, it's interesting as you read these last two chapters that guys are going to read in his autobiography. There's kind of I don't know if guys will notice the a jump. The I think in the second to last chapter, um, Hudson Taylor is 34 years old when he's you know he started the China Inland Mission and then he's headed over to China and then all of a sudden in the last chapter he's 68 years old and he's right. <laughs> and he's reporting back on some of the things that the China Inland Mission did and it actually the timeline throughout this autobiography is kind of weird he jumps around at different times and bits but uh, but I as I noticed that it did help me think about a question that I often ask guys. Actually, you and I have talked about this. I asked you this question, and I think it's a good uh, discussion point for a group of friends. But it says, it's, okay, what if you had the chance to visit the 65-year-old you? What do you hope to see when you visit the 65-year-old you? So for me, you know, I'm I'm about to turn 40 years old. um, So as I'm looking forward in my life, uh, a couple of decades from now, what do I hope to see if I were able to spend the afternoon with the 65 year old me? Cause that's kind of what happens all of a sudden in this book, you go from 38 year old Hudson Taylor to, whoa, fast forward. And now you get a glimpse of what happened, you know, a couple of decades later. And you know, what's interesting is most guys answer, as I've asked that question to a lot of guys, most guys answer is something like, well, you know, I hope to see that my wife is still with me. You know, <laughs> yeah. I hope to see that my, that my kids still love me. Um, I hope to, to, to see that I'm out of debt, you know, or there's some sort of financial goal within that. Um, guys say, you know, I, I hope that I'm still physically healthy at 65. I think a lot of guys look at the lives of their fathers and the, the failing yeah. physical health later in life and they're like, okay, I need to change things. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of guys do say, I, I hope I'm still following Christ and, and, and maturing in Christ. Um, I think those are all great answers. Those are the answers I give. But then you contrast that with what you see at the end of Hudson Taylor's life. And I'm like, man, when you fast forward to the end of Hudson Taylor's life, here's what you see. His wife dies. Some of his children die. His health is is not great. And he's still basically living in poverty. <laughs> and he's still like, <laughs> my whole life. So, so it's it's kind of a, guy, a picture of a guy who even a, at the end of his life is like seemingly unremarkable. So I guess the question I have for you is just, did we just ask guys to spend eight weeks of their lives Study a guy who is ultimately unremarkable. I think what what stands out to me is what you realize as Hudson Taylor's life goes on is he doesn't view himself as his legacy. Hmm. So often, what do you want to be in when you're 65? You know, yeah, you think of yourself, you think of your own financial status, you think of your physical health, um, all the rest of it. Um, he's got something else in his sight. And uh, it reminds me of the words where, you know, John the Baptist says of Jesus, I must decrease that he must might increase. And, and for Hudson Taylor, there's this, yeah, if, if you just measure uh, his well-being based on his health, his finances, there's not much to look at. But actually what he's done is he's invested in this China Inland Mission. 
Yeah. And it's gone from just him being over to uh, I think initially there's 12 that it, that come and there's 24 and uh -huh. then they send 70 and, and then it gets like a hundred and eventually they're going for a thousand, you know, they get to the point where they're actually like trying to get a, th and they're trying to strategically touch every lost region of the whole of this massive, massive, massive country. And uh, so it, when I think of Hudson Taylor, I think of uh, there's a, there's a poem, there's a famous Scottish uh, hymn writer, uh, Horatius Bonar, who wrote a poem, only remembered by the things I have done. Mm. And it's this poem about, he wants to be forgotten, but he wants the deeds to go on. And whether people can recognize that he did it or not, it doesn't matter. And for Hudson Taylor, it's not about him having a biography written about him. He wants China to be reached. And yeah. so he's willing to lay it all, even his physical health, even his finances on the line so that, uh, so that China can be blessed by the gospel. And I think when you put it in that view, it's like, yeah, he's small, he's feeble, my goodness, what a life, you know, what an yes. investment yes. in God's mission. Yeah, I, I think that by the time you get to this, the end of this autobiography, what you realize is that this was never really a story about Hudson Taylor, right? That's yeah. kind of what he's trying to tell you by the end is like, this was never really a story about me. And especially you get into some of the stats that he gives in the last chapter. Uh, and, and, you know, this is the, him reflecting back on the end of his life and him reflecting back on what God has done. And he gives stats about what ultimately ended up being, like you said, the China Inland Mission, which is way bigger beyond him. So here's, you know, I know a lot of us are looking at, okay, what, what's me at 65? What do I look like? What are my, what's my stat sheet? Here's, here's the stat sheet that Hudson Taylor shares. China Inland Mission in 1900, in the year 1900, I think he was 68 years old at that time, had 811 missionaries, uh, had baptized 12,964 people, had 200, had organized 266 churches in China. And had six hospitals that they started. And there's more. There's, this is just a small piece of the stats he shares. But even just that, I'm like, good gosh, this is clearly a story that's way bigger and about way more than just Hudson Taylor. And that's why I think he's remarkable. That's why he's, it's, it's worth talking about and having a friend like that is he never intended this to end with just one missionary going to China and dying in China. That was, you know, you know, he did hope that this would go way beyond him and be more, you know, uh, about more than just him. But within that, I do want to say too, um, that Hudson Taylor's life wasn't all great and perfect because he does share some, some pretty terrible stats in this last chapter as well. Because in that same year of 1900, he lost 58 missionaries and 21 children murdered. They were, they were, they were killed. 58 of his missionaries, 21 children murdered and killed. He had a lot of death and devastation in his life. And so there is almost even a, a dark side in a, in a difficulty um, to the end of Hudson Taylor's life as well. It wasn't all perfect, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's part of, um, the reality that guys need to glean from his life that um, when he's an old man, you know, there's this, the boxer rebellion, there's this movement in China where there's a very strong anti-foreign um, passion that even like legally is permitting people to put foreigners to death. And that's causing missionaries to be a uh, martyr mm -hmm. um, for the sake of the gospel. And, you know, he's watching all of this and uh, you know, it, it just reminds us that, you know, yeah, the, the 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 Disney version of a heroic story mm. where the sunset fades and there's no difficulty, there's no sorrow, there's no lasting grief. You know, he he's going through um, all kinds of emotions and I'm trying to find the uh, quotation, but there's this really powerful, you know, toward the end of his life where he's um, you know, he's actually in Sweden and he's he's there to recover, and uh, you know, he just makes this comment, you know, that he, that he can't really think that he can't really pray, but yeah. what he can do is he can trust as these telegrams are coming in. And I think what's amazing is, man, that at that point, that was just, that was the habituated disposition of his heart. His default was trust. And when there was nothing else that he could do, he could just rest in wow. God's love and in God's faithfulness. And I think the fact that, yeah, not just as new churches are being planted and money's pouring in, but as missionaries are being martyred and he's hearing about the death of children, it's the same. He's still resting regardless. And uh, I think that to me just, it shines out. This is one of those things that really shines as heroic in his life. 
Yeah, he he remained consistent from from beginning to end as a man who trusted God. That's kind of you know how how you summarize some of his life. Yeah, he definitely trusted God even in the in the dark times, especially. Um, but even in the the stats of all those wins, yeah, he he never saw himself as as the hero in in a sense. Um, which okay, so that begs the question for me, Joe, <laughs> because here it is we've. We've asked guys to do the hero challenge and look at the life of a, a Christian hero, Hudson Taylor. I don't know. I kind of have the question, what is it that makes a hero? How, how do we, you know, we've identified Hudson Taylor as a, as a Christian hero that guys need to look at. But then it, again, his life is somewhat unremarkable. If you just look at his life, not, you know, what ultimately the China Inland Mission did. Um, so what is it that makes a hero? Yeah, I think for me, a hero is somebody who there, there's some excellence mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of life or of character that, that we all, that we recognize. So what you're saying is the, the non-believer has a different standard of, of what is truly worth worthy and excellent and, and, and um, glorious in the human life. And we disagree on these things, but within the Christian frame of uh, reference, there are certain qualities that we say, no, that's excellent. That's beautiful. That's glorious. And when somebody has one of these traits, call them a virtue, and it just shines. And so it's like, you know, you're looking up in the sky and, um, you know, you can see all the little twinkling stars. And then if you've ever seen a planet and it's just a little bit brighter than all the other stars, um, it shines consistently, whereas the other ones all twinkle. Like every once in a while you see a Christian and there's like, they just shine. And there's something specific that they put on display that we all say, wow that's excellent. That's worthy of praise. And uh, they're not the complete package. They're not perfect. Um, but you can't, but help think I know more about what it means to, to follow mm -hmm. Jesus. As I look at that person's life, and I think you look at Hudson Taylor and, uh, there is just something that just shines yeah. and it's the dependency. Um, it's the trust, you know, mm -hmm. these elements, this living by faith, um, that's the specific grace that the spirit gave him. And we've got to recognize that's a gift. Hmm. The thing is, it wasn't just innate. Um, it's a gift that God gave him in order to help us demonstrate the same kind of quality in our life. So it's a gift to us as well. So Hudson Taylor is a gift from God for us, challenging us to, uh, to live a life of greater dependency and trust in God. And so hopefully we can be a little bit brighter as we shine as well. Yeah, I think that when you ask the question, what is a Christian hero? Um, some of that just comes down to you realizing as a Christian, especially as we communicate to men during this challenge, like don't aim for hero, aim for servant. Like I, that's what I kind of get. That's one of the insights I have from Hudson Taylor's life, who I do see as a Christian hero. He never aimed for hero. He aimed for servant. He <laughs> And I want to be that kind of guy. I, I I keep coming back to throughout this eight weeks. I keep coming back to that scene when he was a teenager. And after his conversion, he 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 tells the story of him laying on the ground in prayer and just surrendering his life to God and then just saying, God, what do you want me to do? And I just can't escape that. And uh, I've, I've even, you know, if, if, if guys are following along with the prayer guide we've given them, how to pray like Hudson Taylor, it's part of that prayer guide. And I've been using that every day. And it's been one of the most challenging prayers. God, what do you want me to do? Uh, because it forces you into the posture of a servant. It forces you into the posture of surrender. And it forces you to listen to God and trust God and that he does have something for you to do and that you must follow in obedience. And it's just, it's a very big Big challenge, but it is a different approach from saying, "Hey, uh, there's a, such a thing as, as you know." Evan and Joe have identified that there are Christian heroes in this world. I want to be that guy. Uh, you know, that's not our aim. Uh, I want, man. There, there is. We want guys to aim for be a servant, man. Right? That's the upside down kingdom that Jesus, uh, you know, pitches to the world. Is that things? Things are not like the world pitches. Everything's upside down. Be a servant. And you may find yourself leaving some sort of legacy that ultimately your children and grandchildren are proud of, but, but aim for being a servant. Yeah. And I think this is the difference between like fame and, and what's truly heroic. You know, we live in a culture that uh, glamorizes fame and, you know, you can get all kinds of popularity on social media or elsewhere. Um, without having any real substance, but the people God uses are the people, like you said, who don't self-designate themselves for a task. Yeah. Um, you know, you look at Hudson Taylor, and again, it's not surprising from the outside looking in that he was used so greatly by God, because like you said, 
the, the attitude of his heart was just one of lowly submission. Mm-hmm. And that's precisely, that's the kind of servant, you know, you think of, um, you know, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbits and, and the, the whole picture, you know, it's the unexpected ones that get the great tasks. And that's what that's meant in that book to, to, to represent that, you know, in our world with the kingdom of God, yeah, he's going to tap the guy on the shoulder who truly has humility. That's the guy who's a candidate to do something truly remarkable for the kingdom. And so, uh, yeah, rather than, you know, decide to go out and win glory for yourself, learn the lesson of how to just come sit at the feet of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And the more you sit at those feet, the more you have that posture of humility, you're going to find yourself being asked to do things that do have real weight and glory, but it's going to be because there's an attitude of humility. Yeah. I think that guys uh, understanding the big picture of life here, as we look, we're looking this week at the end of Hudson Taylor's life, seeing and recognizing Hey guys, congratulations. If you've made it to the end of this eight week challenge, if you're one of the guys, I know a lot of guys have probably quit along the way, but if, if you've made it to the end of this eight week challenge and have memorized those promises of God and have, you know, spent time pray, praying every day, have spent time with friends, uh, you know, discussing and challenging one another. Congratulations. That's excellent. However, eight, an eight week challenge does not make a Christian hero. Like that, that that's not how this works, right? You don't spend eight weeks just like, yes, and I'm going to double down. Everything's going to be great. And then all of a sudden you become a guy who's made a big impact. This is a lifelong pursuit, right? And so we hope that this is eight weeks that kind of gets you on a path and on a track. But uh, I, you look at the life of Hudson Taylor, that you can't narrow down an eight week span of his life. And that's it. That's the one thing he did. Being a Christian hero just takes one task, just one thing. You do one thing. No, it's a, it's a series of small steps throughout a life of surrendering yourself to God and being in trust to God. Uh, that ultimately, I think, makes people say, "Man, that that's that's an aspect of a hero." I don't know. Is there anything else that you would say, man? This would this is something guys need to aim for, and a heroic element we see in the life of Hudson Taylor. Yeah, I just would say, consecrate yourself fully for the service of God, um, not with any superficial hope that this is going to make all of your dreams come true and make you happy, you know, uh, through the whole of your life. One of the things I, I think that's most amazing of, of Hudson Taylor's writings, it's, there's a kind of a, a diary entry. It, it's something he wrote that it didn't, wasn't really uncovered till after he had died, but he, he talks in this, this, um, this entry about just the jealous love of God. Hmm. And about honestly, the 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 kind of grief and suffering that goes into being a real instrument of God. If if you ask yourself the question, I mean, you read the life of Moses and say, would you want to be Moses? I don't know. Like <laughs> Moses had a hard life. <laughs> would you want to be Elijah? I don't know. Um, you know, when you God really sets his hand upon you and says, I've got something special for you to do, it's a privilege, but it's a it's a sobering um um you know, role to have. And I'm just going to read some of this to, to guys so they can, you know, hear the honesty hmm. from Hudson Taylor, what it was like to have to do some of the things that he did. He says, uh, if God has called you to be really like Jesus in all your spirit, hmm. he will draw you into a life of crucifixion and humility hmm. and put on you such demands of obedience that he will not allow you to follow other Christians. Hmm. And in many ways, he will seem to let other good people do things he will not let you do. The Holy Spirit will keep you poor because he wants you to have something better than gold. And that is a helpless dependence on him. The Lord will let others be honored and put forward and keep you hidden away in obscurity because he wants some choice, fragrant fruit for his coming glory that can only be produced in the shade. The Holy Spirit will put a strict watch over you with a jealous love and will rebuke you with little for little words or feelings or for wasting your time over which other Christians seem never to be distressed. Mm-hmm. So make up your mind that God is an infinite sovereign who has a right to do as he pleases with you. And he may not explain to you a thousand things which may puzzle your reason and how he deals with you, but he will take you at your word And when you absolutely sell yourself to be his slave, he will wrap you up in a jealous love and let other people say and do many things, which he will not let you say or do. But then he says that when you've reached that point, you've entered kind of the the vestibule of heaven. You've entered this place of intimacy with God. You read that, that's a hard role to want to take on. When God jealously loves you and really takes you for himself, he owns you in a way that can be really uncomfortable but ultimately leads you into a place of intimacy that's worthwhile. 
But I think we need to think seriously if we're going to pray and really ask God to be fully devoted to his service, what that might mean for us. Having heard you read that bit from Hudson Taylor, a couple of thoughts come to mind. One, man, it's been such a rich time spending uh, all this time listening to the words of Hudson Taylor. The other thought is, gosh, I can't wait to get away from the words of Hudson Taylor because it's so challenging. <laughs> I'm reading that. I'm like, golly, shut up, friend. Like, this is, this is hard, man. It's very, it is very challenging. So uh, where where do guys go from here? Where, where do we want guys to go from here after having spent eight weeks with our friend Hudson Taylor? We're probably not going to, you know, most guys aren't going to pick up another book and read about his life again. They'll probably forget most of what they read about Hudson Taylor. Uh, over the next you know month, um, next year, if you ask guys, you know, to recite the eight promises that they memorized last year, they probably won't be able to to recite them. I don't know. So, what what was all this for, and where do guys where do guys go from here? Uh, my my advice would be, guys, go to your room, uh, shut the door, get on your knees, imagine yourself holding your hands cupped and it full of water, and that water represents your life and just pour it out on the ground before God. And uh, I dare you to really tell the Lord that you want him to have all of you. Mm. If you reach that place at the end of this, that you really want God to have all of you, whatever that entails, scary prayer to pray, but a, a powerful one. And I think that'd be the best way to end this challenge. You you sound so much like Hudson Taylor now, Joe. Now I'm not. I don't know if I like. That, <laughs> <laughs> that was a very Hudson Taylor answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a Hudson Taylor challenge, right? Yeah, I yeah, know. I know. That no, was good. It was great. I was hoping for something a little more simple and you know, cute. But that was that was good. <laughs> That's a, that is a great challenge. A great place to leave, guys. And I I'd, I'd encourage guys also. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of don't don't waste a book. You know, if if you've read something and it has made an impact on you, maybe one simple thing you can do is just on a piece of paper, on a document, on your computer or on your phone, make a a list. You know, top ten things I learned from the life of Hudson Taylor. You know, ten ten lessons. On, just just something that you can refer back to as all these stories do leave your mind. Um, that may prove beneficial to refer back at different times of your life. And I just encourage guys going forward um, to not let the friendship element of this challenge leave. You know, uh, a lot of the answers going back to that first question I asked, you know, hey, if you could visit the 65 year old you, what do you hope to see? Um, one thing that guys do leave out there is friendship. There's a, uh, you know, a lot of us don't think about the fact that we don't want to be that lonely man um, later in life. And so I'd say, man, let's continue to make part of our spiritual fitness and our spiritual growth, doing this alongside other men and uh, see what God uh, continues to do with that. Be challenged by, yeah, now I've got to listen to Joe say things like Hudson Taylor because he's my friend and I'm going to have to deal with that. But uh, but it's a good thing, right? We need friends like that in our lives. So I encourage y'all to, to continue on in some of the habits that you started, uh, continue building on those. I hope you guys have enjoyed the Hero Challenge. Uh, y'all give us feedback. Let, let us know if there's anything that you, you think, man, next time y'all do this, I hope y'all prove it in this way. We'd love to hear any feedback you have uh, so that we can continue to build on this. But thank y'all for joining us for this eight-week hero challenge and uh, join us back on the podcast as we'll get started with something else.